India needed the room, so um, I, I know it's a little uncomfortable to eat um, on your laps, but really appreciate everybody coming to this um, event for the Congressional Internet Caucus and its advisory committee, Interpreting Grokster. Um, before we get going with today's program, I really want to introduce the, the chairman of the Congressional Internet Caucus and the uh, co-chairman of the subcommittee on the courts, the Internet and Intellectual Property, and the Judiciary Committee, uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte. Tim, thank you very much. This is the biggest podium I've ever seen. <laughs> Arlene, you, we don't have a step stool for you. <laughs> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, this is a very timely uh, panel discussion regarding the Grokster decision, and uh, it will be uh, very well presented by our very able group of panelists. As you know, the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, crafted what I think to be a pro-consumer and balanced approach that will encourage technological innovation and creativity, provide consumers with greater choice, and protect the legitimate interests of copyright owners. While upholding the Sony Betamax case, the Supreme Court held that if a company actively encourages people to violate copyright law, then that company can be held liable for the results of its actions. The court recognized that companies like Grokster that provide the tools and promote massive online infringement should be held responsible. The court also noted the need for legitimate technological innovation and creativity, saying that their ruling does nothing to compromise legitimate commerce or discourage innovation having a lawful purpose. The Grokster decision signals to authors and performers that the court intends to enforce intellectual property rights. The more confident authors and performers are that their rights will be enforced online, the more authors and performers will be willing to offer their works over the Internet, which will also ensure that the more innovative products and services, including new technologies, will be able to deliver these works and they will be available to consumers. Uh, it's also my pleasure to take note of the fact that uh, this week we have several members of the European Parliament visiting us, members of the European Internet Foundation, which is a, an organization that uh, is uh, very much like the Congressional Internet Caucus. In fact, uh, Congressman Rick Boucher and I were uh, able to participate in the inaugural opening of that uh, Internet Foundation in Brussels several years ago. And since that time, we have been exchanging visits between uh, Brussels and Strasbourg on the European side and here in Washington. And this week we have a number of uh, the European Internet Foundation members, including two uh, who are here with us for this briefing. Uh, one is uh, the Honorable Malcolm Harbour, a conservative member of uh, the European Parliament from the United Kingdom. And the other who's going to share a few words with us uh, is the Honorable Arlene McCarthy, also a member of the European Parliament from the United Kingdom uh, and a member of the Labour Party. Uh, and Arlene, if you would come up and join us now, we would love to hear a few words from you as well. Let's give her a warm welcome. Um, I have a special little step uh, that gets me on and off the bus as we get around Washington. I should have carried it with me in my bag had I known that the podium was going to be so grand. Um, Malcolm and I are, are delighted to be here today and delighted really to have come at such a, a, an interesting time uh, in terms of discussions around the future uh, of the Internet and indeed uh, the decision from the Supreme Court. Um, I personally uh, am a member of the Transatlantic Policy Network and we're here also uh, as a group from the TPN. Uh, TPN uh, is working on many issues, one of which we now have a special task force uh, looking at uh, intellectual property uh, issues, and I am co-chairing that with Jim Sensenbrenner, who is the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we're specifically looking at uh, third country infringements and looking at China uh, and Russia. Uh, and as Bob said, we are also very delighted to have a very active cooperation here with the, the uh, caucus uh, in Congress, the Internet Caucus, um, that is part of the work that we do on the European Internet Foundation. Malcolm and I are both uh, members of the Board of Governors, uh, and again, we're here this week to have lots of, I think, fruitful discussions, interesting discussions uh, on the new technology issues and the development of the Internet. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that in the discussions that we have, Bob, we learn a lot from each other, we exchange views, uh, and we are certainly looking to try and improve uh, best practice in this area. And as Bob rightly said, we want to be pro-consumers uh, we want to get balanced legislation in this area that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, block technology uh, but leads us to a situation also where we can, uh, we can uh, protect intellectual property on the Internet. 
Perhaps just to give you a, a, a very brief overview, we in the European Parliament and indeed in the European Union, um, we have passed some significant laws in this area. We have passed a law several years ago uh, on copyright in the Internet Society. We have recently, just before we broke up for our elections, passed a law on the enforcement of intellectual property rights, a civil remedy bill. Uh, we are now waiting for the European Commission, which is the executive branch, which produces laws for us and that we then co-legislate on. We're now waiting for the Digital Rights Management uh, uh, Directive, which we are expecting any day now. And again, that will be, have a big, a big significant impact uh, on how we, uh, we legislate and operate in this area. And in fact, just uh, before we came here this week, uh, I was sent uh, on the internet uh, the Commission's new proposal for a bill on criminal sanctions uh, for intellectual uh, property violations. Um, I have to say, so far, we have not dealt with or looked into the issue of peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, that's why today I think it's an interesting discussion for Malcolm and I uh, to listen to, uh, to listen and learn. We always look at Supreme Court decisions here in the U.S. with a lot of interest. And as I said, particularly because we want to look at the impact on the development of technology innovation, but also trying to ensure we get balanced laws uh, which protect the creative uh, industries, which we also value very much in Europe. Uh, and also we want to make sure that consumers have rights uh, of access uh, as well. You may perhaps have heard, uh, just to finish on this note, of our spectacular decision, I think, just as we finish this parliamentary session, uh, to uh, basically uh, send back to the Commission or to reject the proposal uh, for a uh, directive for, uh, on software patenting. And that's because we decided that this was an issue of immense complexity and enormous technical detail. Uh, we felt that we hadn't got it right, neither the Commission had it right, nor did we find that the discussions in our committee were bringing us to a conclusion that would have been good for business, uh, but also good for small software developers. And so we made the decision uh, to reject the, the proposal and have instead asked the European Commission to come forward rapidly with a European community patent framework, uh, not a specific sectoral framework, but a community patent framework uh, which will now allow us to determine what patent law uh, should be in the EU. And then we can deal with the issues of the internet and software development uh, within that broader umbrella framework of patent law. So again, I'm delighted to be here. We very much look forward to this discussion. And thank you very much, Bob, for making sure that Malcolm and I were invited. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity. And we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene, Malcolm, thank you. Congressman Goulet, thank you for securing us this room. And um, well, let's get into the program. Uh, what we did, the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee is a group of over 200 organizations, uh, public interest groups, nonprofits, trade associations, and corporations that work in collaboration to craft balanced and fair educational programs for our congressional staff and members of Congress. We put together this panel um, through a committee process, um, trying to find the right balance for a panel and allow some interesting views of the Grokster decision and what Congress uh, might need to do or not do. Um, and this is what we came up with. For moderator today, we selected uh, Jonathan Krim, tech policy writer for the Washington Post, a very prolific writer on these issues. And I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan, and, um, and we'll get going with the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and Congressman, and uh, our distinguished guests from Europe. Uh, welcome. I'm going to give you a very, very short and hopefully um, accurate uh, synopsis of the case so that you have a basic framework. There's three very smart lawyers here to my left who will jump all over me if I get something wrong, I'm sure. Um, but if uh, those of you who know the history understand that in 1984 there was a seminal case in this area in which the entertainment industry challenged Sony Corporation's Betamax product, which was a video recording device, on the grounds that this uh, was essentially a tool for copyright infringement. Uh, the United States Supreme Court, in a decision that had tremendous ramifications for decades to come, determined that time shifting, in other words, the act of watching a program at a different time than when it was being broadcast, uh, was not an infringement, was in fact a fair use, and uh, furthermore went on to set a standard for determining infringement by describing uh, an environment in which if a product had a substantial non-infringing use, that is to say legal uses, that even if that product was being used by some for illegal purposes, that was not grounds for infringement. Uh, the, Consumer electronics industry 
the technology industries have uh, for 20 years relied on that. Uh, the movie industry, which brought the case, uh, actually did fairly well in, the, in the, uh, the aftermath of that decision, but has faced increasing pressures from new internet-based internet technologies that enable mass distribution on a scale uh, never envisioned during the Betamax days. Uh, and there have been a series of uh, legal cases particularly circulating around peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services such as, uh, if you've heard these names, Kazaa, Grokster, Morpheus, Streamcast, etc., LimeWire, and so on. How many of you have used those? That's a trick question. <laughs> okay. Um, in a series of cases that uh, ultimately um, have been decided, most of the cases have been decided in favor of uh, the, the file sharing networks on the grounds of the Betamax decision, and that included a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision argued by Fred von Lohmann in the middle here, and I'll introduce these folks uh, fully in a moment, in which the case decided that in which the court decided that the movie industry's and the recording industry's case against Grokster and Streamcast networks could not proceed because there were substantial non-infringing uses of the technology. Uh, the entertainment industry challenged this at the Supreme Court and just recently in a case argued by Mr. Verrilli, the court decided that the Ninth Circuit had made a mistake in this particular case. It said that it had an affirmative obligation to examine inducement of infringement through means other than simply the way the technology works and that the case had to be sent back to be determined on the merits of whether or not these two defendants actually encouraged their users to infringe copyright. And so uh, We'll hear a little bit more about whether that case, uh, where that case stands in terms of its scheduling for review. But what the court did not do was say that the Betamax standard no longer applies. In fact, it went out of its way to say substantially it does. However, there are some interesting wrinkles here, and we're going to get into that uh, with our distinguished panelists. To my immediate left is Don Verrilli. He's a senior attorney uh, partner at Jenner and Block. Uh, Jenner and Block is not one of the biggest names uh, in the legal industry. However, if you talk to people who know about Supreme Court arguments, Jenner and Block is probably right at the top. That is their uh, incredible expertise that they've practiced for many, many years. To Don's left and in the middle is Fred von Lohmann. Fred is senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit public interest digital rights advocacy group in, based in San Francisco. Uh, and Fred has asked me to make it clear that his comments today are his own and not meant to represent the views of Streamcast, which was the client that he represented in the Ninth Circuit, or of any other EFF client. And to Fred's left is Andrew Greenberg. Andrew is an attorney with Carlton Fields, which represented the IEEE, which is an international engineering standards body in technology, which filed one of the briefs that argued that the case should be decided much in the way that the Supreme Court actually did decide the case. So we're going to jump in first with some very short three to four minute opening remarks from each of our panelists. I am going to keep a fairly hard watch on folks and then we'll get into Q&A from me and the panelists and then ultimately Q&A from all of you. Don, why don't you go first? Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, with respect to what the Supreme Court did in the Grokster decision handed down last month, I think there are three points that are centrally important. The first one is this. The court stated unanimously and forcefully and clearly that the underlying activity at stake here, the downloading of copyrighted movies and music from the Internet through these peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services is indeed copyright infringement and that it's occurring on a massive scale. So that aspect of the debate, it seems to me, is now conclusively over with respect to what the Supreme Court said about it. Second important thing that happened is that the court set forth what we think was a sensible, common sense standard 
for uh, <coughs> addressing these issues with respect to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services, namely that if you build a business that's based on inducing copyright infringement, promoting it, and you profit from it, that you're going to be responsible for the harms that you cause, the infringement that you cause, and you can be subject to a full, the full range of judicial relief to get you to stop doing it. And then if you have a situation like the, the situation in this case where the, the business is being run here, uh, more than 90 percent of the use of them was demonstrably for infringement, you're going to be in a very difficult situation under this standard, and that's as it should be. The third point, and I think maybe the most important one, is what the court recognized, I think, again unanimously, that the core message of the 1984 Sony Betamax decision that Jonathan referred to is that there's got to be balance in this area of the law, that it's not a matter of saying, well, I've got a cool technology here, therefore I get a free pass and can do whatever I want, that the law's got to respect the legitimate claims to protection of copyright owners, as well as create free space for legitimate innovation. And that's innovation devoted to products and services that have legitimate uses that aren't ultimately devoted to copyright infringement. And that third point, I think, is going to be critically important going forward as well. Thank you. Fred. I think it's important in considering what the court did in this case to remember actually what the main event behind this case really was all about. This is really not a case of fundamental interest to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, community. Frankly, peer-to-peer -peer has shown quite clearly that it's going to continue to go on as it has since Napster uh, brought it to the fore in 1999. This is really a case about the rules that will apply to our entire technology sector. So the question the court was asked was, when will a technology company be held responsible for copyright infringements committed with its technology by third parties that it does not control. In other words, when can Sony be held responsible for what someone may do with a VCR? When can Xerox be held responsible for what someone may do with photocopiers? And of course, in the digital age, all of the new digital technologies that are coming uh, to market are on the drawing board today. The first question is, you know, you, hundreds of these calls happen in Silicon Valley every day. A company, a small company, the next garage innovator who wants to be Apple or Hewlett Packard, they pick up the phone, they call their lawyer, they say, I've got a great technology, but I can't guarantee that people won't be able to use it for infringing purposes. That's not what I intend it for, but there's no way I can control or guarantee what people will do with it. After all, that's the same boat that folks who pioneer the World Wide Web, personal computer, hard drives, all of these technology vendors were in that same position when they were bringing their technologies to market. So imagine that call happens. It's critically important that the lawyer on the other end of the line be able to advise technology companies how to order their affairs so they know where the lines are and what the law requires. That's why the entire technology community, no matter which side of this case they were on, they were unanimous on one point. And that was that we need clear, bright line rules so that technology companies can know in advance what they are and are not allowed to build. Why is this so important? Well, here a bit of background about copyright law may be useful. What happens if you're wrong? The way copyright law works, copyright owners are entitled to as much as $150,000 in damages per work infringed. Right? So one iPod on that standard can give rise to as much as half a billion dollars in damages. One iPod. I don't think that's what Congress had in mind when they enacted that remedial regime, but that is the potential chilling effect that technology companies face. So there's uncertainty and then there's uncertainty. And this is why we worry and this is why the technology com companies all worry that we need to get this rule right and we need to get the rule clear. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court didn't do that in the Grokster case. The trouble is less with the inducement standard that the court announced than with the other areas of law which the court refused to clarify. So we have now the Betamax defense, which you've heard described, on which the technology sector has relied for two decades. We don't know any more about that than we did before this case. The court essentially said we're not, we're not going to overturn it, but we're also not going to take sides and answer the debates about how it actually applies. Similarly, the entertainment companies argued throughout this case that so long as your technology could have been designed differently 
to be less susceptible to infringing uses. Technology companies should be held responsible, essentially, for not designing their technologies differently, more to the preferences of the entertainment sector. We, of course, think that's a terrible rule. It would, if that were the rule when Sony had debuted its Betamax VCR, obviously the VCR wouldn't have looked the way it did. The Supreme Court also punted on that question said, we're not going to address that question. Inducement is enough on this case. We're not going to touch the, uh, the, the larger issue. So what we're left with is a real legal minefield for technology companies. Uh, it's an issue that continues now to plague technology companies, lawyers, when they have to answer this question. I know how to tell a client not to induce infringement. Uh, and in fact, I think you can, if you look at the peer-to-peer -peer companies in question, Go to the website of Streamcast, the guys who make Morpheus, my client. Go to the website of Kazaa. Go to the website of any of these companies. You'll not see any trace of inducement. These companies are not encouraging, advertising, promoting infringing uses. That's just not happening. The trouble is, what about the other theories? What about the theories that, that the Supreme Court left unaddressed? That's what we're all going to be struggling with, and that's what I hope Congress may turn its attention to. Thank you, Fred. Andrew. As Fred pointed out, we engineers are on the front line of the uh, copyright system. We create copyrighted content, but we also create the technology to copy and deliver that content. And while you hear eloquent account of the interest of the copyright owners on one hand and the technology makers on the other, we stand for the proposition that the intellectual property framework is and must be about the balancing of those interests. IEEE USA was concerned that neither the Ninth Circuit opinion in Grokster nor the position taken by MGM on appeal adequately balances those interests. And that's why we filed an amicus brief on behalf of neither party proposing yet another approach modeled after the Patent Act. We believe that the court properly found that a company that makes technology with legitimate uses cannot be responsible for the infringements of its customers unless the company has actively induced its customers to infringe. In my view, that ruling strikes the right balance for two reasons. First, the court properly framed the question by refusing to ground liability on either the design of the technology or the conduct of the customers, as some had urged. The court focused instead on the conduct of the defendant company and only on conduct that was distinct from the ordinary marketing, sale, and support of that technology. Second, by modeling from the Patent Act standard for active inducement, the court drew upon a well-developed body of technology law, one that withstood the test of time. And while I'm, I'm, I understand concerns about the uncertainty of not having final decision on every case yet, if we're going to argue that this standard smothers innovation, we still have to account first for why the parade of horribles did not happen yet under the Patent Act. Our research suggests that active inducement has at least three elements, that there is the requirement of an overt act that's independent of the mere design and marketing that proximately causes the third party to infringe, the requirement that that act be undertaken with knowledge that the induced conduct was necessarily infringing and that the intent that the infringements shall have occurred. The devil, of course, is in the details. Fred is quite right. But the applicable case law under both the copyright and patent acts to date go a long way towards fleshing that out. And the game is not over and there's much more to do. The balance is only going to be preserved when the public's right to access the content and the technology as well is maximized. So there are a couple of open questions to be answered, and the balance will re require careful scrutiny uh, by this Congress, and at the end of the day, the Congress will be the architects of the balance. I suggest we monitor two things carefully. As Fred's suggestions, uh, suggested, we monitor uncertainty. Uncertainty about the application of the standard under the copyright, whether it's actual or perceived, is the effective equivalent of a rule that bars innovation. Under the Patent Act today, a lawyer can give the client an opinion concerning secondary liability for contributory infringement merely by considering non-infringing uses. And then the lawyer can advise the client how to establish internal policies to avoid liability for inducement. We should watch and be vigilant as the lower courts construe Grokster to preserve at least at the bottom line that level of comfort and certainty. And also, as Fred pointed out, we should monitor remedies. 
As we move further from the bright line rule of Sony, we have to recognize there are significant differences in how remedies are attributed under the Patent and Copyright Acts. Because there can be significant damages arriving from, arising from the statutory regime, that can be ruinous even for very large companies. So that even if the rule works, as we suggest, even if in fact inducement is controllable and the risk of actually getting it wrong is small, the size of potential remedy could still act to uh, chill innovation. Solutions in this arena, and there are some obvious ones, will likely require some legislation. So in short, by adopting the active inducement standard, the Supreme Court found an elegant and just balance to preserve both technological innovation and exclusive rights in a copyright. Contrary to much of the spin I have seen, the studios did not get all that they sought, and the technologists did not lose the war. At the end of the day, I think it's the public who won. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me start, and I want to drill down on, on, I think, what is one of the key issues here, and that is uh, where we are on inducement now, post this decision. And I guess maybe I'll start with you, Don. Um, your clients clearly would not agree that if a company simply cleaned up its marketing act uh, and didn't mention Rip Burn Mix or you can uh, get any music you want, that that would be enough to demonstrate good faith. So in light of this decision, how do we define inducement going forward? What what are the parameters that you think the lower courts are going to need to look at, or is this going to be a case-by-case, case, we know it when we see it sort of thing? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good question, Jonathan, an important one. I think it's important to start by uh, pointing up, I think, a point of difference with my friend from the IEEE. The court did not define inducement in, in the way that you, you just did. Uh, in fact, I think it went out of its way to say that inducement was a broader uh, standard than that and one that uh, provides the effective protection for copyright that uh, the Sony case 21 years ago said the law needed to provide. Um, and that's, uh, I think, reflected in the opinion itself, that it isn't just a, a know-it-as-you-see-it kind of a standard. Uh, but you look at various objective factors about the behavior of the defendant. Uh, one objective factor that the court pointed to was the question, which is directly relevant here to the peer-to-peer -peer services, it seems to me, is have they designed their uh, approach, their service, in a way that forgoes readily available means for protecting copyright uh, or have they instead tried to build in uh, uh, approaches that would provide meaningful protection to copyright? Now, that's not dispositive on its own, but it's a, a particularly important factor that the Supreme Court said you've got to look to in making a decision about whether what we've got here is inducement or not. And I think the court identified other factors in that nature, and I think it, it did it, Jonathan, to deal exactly with the problem that you identified, which is that the, you know, fine, I, you know, actually there is a good bit of evidence of inducement uh, over the past several years on behalf of the uh, companies that uh, were at issue in the Supreme Court decision in, in the Grokster case. In fact, uh, nine justices in the Supreme Court said that the evidence was overwhelming and that the district judge, when the case went back, ought to take a careful look and think about whether the court ought to just grant summary judgment for the recording companies and the movie studios based on the strength of that evidence. So that evidence is there. but. Next time, you know, now with the Supreme Court decision in place, it's certainly the case that companies who want to capitalize and build an exploitative business in the way that these companies have will be more careful. And I think that's precisely why the court said you've got to look to, uh, you, you can uh, look to objective criteria about the way in which they're structuring their business and structuring their activities. But, but the court did seem to go out of its way to, to say that product design was not one of those criteria. And, and so, and that was one of the things that you had argued was important. You also argued a question of preponderance of use, um, which the court sort of left really unaddressed, I think. So what then are those objective inducement standards beyond marketing and advertising? Well, I think one is, I mean, the, the court listed three of them, and I think the most important one of the three is the one I just identified. They certainly said you can't make a case of 
secondary copyright liability based solely on product design. But at the same time, they said, and I think nine justices said clearly, that if a business is foregoing readily available means of protecting copyright, in this case, for example, foregoing readily available means of imposing, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of implementing filtering, uh, that that can be a basis for inferring the requisite intent. And then the court identified other objective factors of that nature. So it was quite clear in saying that it's more than just a case about marketing. Uh, and equally important, it seems to me, it's more than a case about uh, and, and I think this is quite clear that nine justices rejected this view. It's more than a case of, uh, of having to show that the defendant went out and per sought to particularly induce the infringement of a particular work at a particular time by particular individuals, and that the remedy could then only be limited to undoing that harm. And this you find in footnote 13 of the opinion. The court actually expressly rejected that view and said, that's far too narrow an understanding of what the law ought to be and what we're saying here, that you can look at the way a company runs its business and infer from that overall set of act activities whether they're engaged in inducement. And if they are, you can remedy the, the harms caused by the overall set of activities. So I think that's centrally important. Fred, why don't you sort of jump in and, and give us your sense of what specifically now the lower court is going to uh, need to hang on to in in light of the decision in determining active inducement well I, I think I uh, disagree with uh, with uh, my adversary mr. Verrilli here on uh, his view of inducement the Supreme Court ruling here is quite clear that there are two things that you must show uh, in order to establish inducement you must show intent to induce and uh, mr. Verrilli is absolutely right that uh, the court recognized that lots of things in fact it appears that virtually anything is relevant to the question of establishing what the company may or may not have intended. Um, that's part of the problem with intent-based standards. Literally everything is, gets thrown in the pot, and it's very hard for companies to judge in advance how things will turn out with a test like that. But the other thing that must be shown, the court made very clear, is that the company or the defendant actually took affirmative acts to induce or encourage or foster infringement. Uh, so I actually think Jonathan's question is exactly right. You will see uh, people who want to develop technologies just be extra careful on the inducement issue not to take any affirmative acts, not to advertise, not to promote, all of that. Already in the peer-to-peer -peer space, there are over 150 different peer-to-peer -peer, uh, software uh, products available out there. Uh, one of the most successful in the world is one called BitTorrent, which actually isn't made by a company at all. It was made by one guy who wrote it as a hobby during a period of unemployment. Uh, he's never promoted it at all. He's never made a penny from it at all. Uh, and so when, if you're worried about peer-to-peer, -peer, this is not going to solve that problem. Uh, in fact, it seems quite evident uh, that if you look at what's gone on, it's not as though peer-to-peer -peer has disappeared overnight in the wake of this decision. Uh, and it's also obviously uh, going to be very difficult for American laws to reach out and somehow stop software developers everywhere on the planet from continuing to develop software that people want. The problem is, for the rest of our technology sector, even if you can advise someone how to avoid inducement, and I actually on this question agree with, uh, uh, with Mr. Greenberg here that you know, you can, I think, sensibly advise companies on the inducement question, particularly because you can advise them to stay away from so-called affirmative acts that foster infringement. I think, as a lawyer, I know how to do that. What I don't know is how I advise a company regarding contributory and vicarious liability, the other two theories, the two theories on which every case since Betamax has turned. On those two theories, the Supreme Court refused to give us guidance. Uh, and that is where the chilling effect of the remedial system that both I and uh, Mr. Greenberg have discussed comes into play. If you're a technology company and your lawyers guess wrong on either contributory or vicarious liability, essentially the company is finished. And that effectively operates as a bar on innovation. If you, that's a bet that, first of all, executives don't want to make, and perhaps more importantly, investors don't want to make. And so you have new technologies. I encourage all of you to take a look at There's a great new technology just hit the shelves a couple of months ago called the Slingbox. 
Uh, it's built by a little company in San Mateo, classic startup, could be the next Apple computer, who knows? It's $249, you put it in your living room, it allows you to watch your television from anywhere you happen to be on enter any internet connected device you have. So they came over to our office, they were watching, uh, you know, the guy was controlling his TiVo back in his, his, his living room, he was sitting in our office watching The Daily Show on his Palm Pilot, right? He was watching it on his laptop. Now this was all stuff, it was his media, right? This wasn't stealing it or downloading it from other unauthorized sources. This was something that he had recorded on his own TiVo in his own living room. He was just watching it remotely over the internet. Fantastic technology. I, you know, hard questions now. What, is that infringing? Isn't it? Does Betamax apply? Doesn't it? Could he have designed the technology differently to make it less susceptible to infringement? Obviously, it could be used for infringement. I mean, these are the questions on which the viability of these new companies will depend. And that, that's the worry here. And that's why I think remedies in particular need to be looked at in order to try to give technology companies, if they can't be sure about where the lines are drawn, at least the, the, the risk shouldn't be apocalyptic. I want to come back to things like Slingbox in a minute, but Andrew, very briefly, if you could tell us back on the inducement question, what you think the bright line test for active inducement now is in the light of this decision? Well, I think we know some things are clear. Uh, the Supreme Court on page 19 of your handout gave its findings and explained where the rule came from and what is not inducement. We also know very clearly what is not inducement, which was the conduct of advertising in Sony. In Sony, there was an advertising saying, buy the Betamax. There was advertising, say, buy the Betamax and use it to record broadcast content. Buy the Betamax and use it to time shift, and much more controversially, buy the Betamax and use it to make private libraries. That was a point highly controversial and not resolved even today. Now, what happens when you sell a, when you sell a product that actually does promote conduct you honestly and in good faith believe is non-infringing, but what if private librarying were not fair use, as Sony believed in that time, and that were not enough to resolve the question? Well, it seems to me that if you look to the patent law from which the Supreme Court drew an honest good faith belief that conduct is fair use would not make promoting that conduct even by advertising and inducement. What is inducement is giving instructions and directions to engage in conduct that cannot be anything other than infringing. So, by the Betamax, it will really streamline your bootleg operations. You'll be able to make copies faster. Clearly inducement. By the Betamax to time shift, clearly not inducement. The interesting question is where there's the good faith belief that you're advertising is actually promoting conduct that's not infringing, but later a court decides that it is. I want to step away from the legal weeds for one minute and try to uh, get you guys to engage this on a slightly higher plane for one minute. Fred, um, I, I would say there's probably no doubt that your client has a pretty good idea that there are a number of users on its service that are using it for infringing purposes. Is there no legal obligation in your mind for them to address that? It's been clear in American copyright law, at least in every case up to now, that technology companies do not owe an obligation to redesign their technologies to please copyright owners or to reduce infringing uses. If that had been the rule in the 1970s, the Betamax would look different, uh, or would have looked different than it did. In fact, in the Sony Betamax case, the copyright owners made precisely this argument. They said they actually had an expert, an engineer, come in in the trial, and they attempted to offer evidence to suggest, hey, Sony could have designed this with what was then a very primitive form of digital rights management. Said Sony could have designed this so that it would respond to a flag that we could put in the signal, and then and we could tell people, record this, don't record this, record this, don't record this. For those of you who or have any familiarity with the so-called broadcast flag debate that's been going on, it's, you know, eternal recurrence of the same, right? I mean, it's the same debate today. The point, however, was that the courts rejected that and said, we are not going to let copyright owners second-guess the design decisions of engineers trying to build innovative products to please the market. 
Uh, and I think that that's the sensible rule. That's a rule that has actually ended up serving everyone very well for the last 20 plus years, despite the complaints of copyright owners, oftentimes early in the, in the lifetime of a technology, that we don't like this, we think there's too much infringement, we think you could have designed it differently, we think you should change it now. Um, those are all arguments that have never been brought under this general rubric of secondary liability. Don, how would you respond to that? That was Fred's uh, very long way of saying that no, in his view, there's absolutely no responsibility whatsoever, no matter how egregious the copyright infringement and how much of it's going on, right? That's what he's saying. But that uh, isn't the law. It wasn't the law before the Supreme Court decided Grokster. It isn't what Sony says. It isn't the law, and it shouldn't be the law, of course. And, um, and I do, if I could, I may be taking this to a... a higher plane than you want, Jonathan, but let me, let me do that anyway. The idea that there has been a complete absence of responsibility and that that's been the key certainty necessary to foster technological innovation for the last two decades seems to me to be manifestly contradicted by lots and lots of cases actually decided by courts applying the law of secondary copyright liability, for one is a good example. Somebody creates a technology that allows you to break in and steal cable signals, okay? It's a device, it's, uh, and, and what it does is allow you to steal copyrighted material. He gets sued. He says, well, yeah, but you know, you can also use this for the following lawful uh, uh, purposes, and therefore it has substantial non-infringing uses. Well, of course, didn't have any problem in that case saying, well, yeah, but that's not what you're doing. Similarly, people have invented technologies that allow you to copy video games. And then they provide you with a few of their own video games that you can lawfully copy. And they give you permission to copy them. And then they say, well, see, this is just a technology. It's neutral about whether you copy it for lawful or unlawful uh, uh, purposes. And in fact, there are obvious lawful ways you can use it because we've given you permission to copy these 10 things. Well, the courts had no problem in those cases saying, yeah, but the whole point of this enterprise you're engaged in is to encourage the unlawful copying and they've imposed liability and these cases have been around for a while and the great technological revolution that we have witnessed in this country in the last 15 years has occurred while courts were deciding these cases and remember of course in 1999 the courts said to Napster no what you're doing here is contributing to copyright infringement on a massive scale and you have to stop doing that and other courts said to other peer-to-peer -peer services, and I do beg to differ, Jonathan, with one thing you said in your introduction, aside from the decisions in the Grokster case in the lower court before the Supreme Court vacated them, all the decisions went the other way and said, no, you can impose secondary liability when businesses act in the way that these businesses do. And that case law has been on the books, and it hasn't deterred all this magnificent innovation we're talking about, and that's because the right answer here is balance. And the right answer is yes, there is a degree of responsibility that, that companies need to take on when they're engaged in these fields. Now, it's got to be a degree of responsibility, it's got to be balanced, and that's why we advocated a balanced test. But the right answer here, and I think that is the most important thing about what the Supreme Court said in Grokster, the right answer here is balance. Well, let me push you a little farther on this then. Your clients have attempted to um, shut down several new technologies with mixed success, I would say. Um, and it seems that we don't always have a very clear sense of what the entertainment industry's definition of copyright infringement is. And so, for example, there is a company that provides a means for uh, you to copy webcasted material. Not downloading, but the, the stream comes across as like a radio program on the internet. And you have the ability as, as many broadcasters are doing now, and you have the ability to copy that programming. Now, I have actually asked the RIAA about this specifically, and what they've said to me is, if you copy the entire program for your private use, it is fair use. But what you may not do is take individual parts of the stream, this song, and then this song, and then this song, and then this song, that may appear first, ninth, twelfth, fifteenth, and create a new piece of media, essentially, that, that aggregates that content. So, we walk into court now and we say, hypothetically, we say, 
these guys are infringing copyright because they're providing the tool that allows you to do what I just described. Where, where do we go in a case like that? Well, I think, you know, this is the kind of answer that lawyers give and that that's, uh, people hate to hear, but I think it depends, right? <laughs> and it, but it does depend. Look, look the, the position of the RIAA there is, is particularly legitimate because what they're trying to protect are the, the rights that they've negotiated there and the rights that exist. And so uh, it seems to me to suggest that there, that what the entertainment industry has tried to do is shut down technology is just manifestly wrong. It's not about technology, just like with BitTorrent. It's not about technology. There's a lot of great legitimate uses for the BitTorrent technology. They exist now. Nobody's trying to sue to stop them. Nobody has sued the inventor of it. There are also illegitimate uses of it, where there are BitTorrent sites where you can go to get movies or television shows or music that's copyrighted. Those are the people who are getting sued. It's not about technology. It's not about shutting down technology. It's about the way businesses use it. And if they use it in a manner that's devoted to copyright infringement, they ought to be responsible for that. That's Fred and balance. Andrew are yeah. champing at the bit here. This, so Andrew, uh, Andrew, you go first because you've been... Sure. I mean, the, the law has never given the guy who writes a jingle the right to dictate technology policy. It just never has. It can't be the law because it would be unworkable. There are millions of jingle writers out there, and if you allowed them to negotiate what our technology was going to look like by committee, you would never have any technology. The Copyright Act was passed in England. The statute of Anne abrogated the monopoly of the people who own printing presses, of the, of, the, of the Stationers Guild. And it's been that way ever since. The Supreme Court in this latest decision couldn't have made that plainer. Liability here is premised on purposeful, culpable expression and conduct only, and is expressly in excluded from that is ordinary marketing and design of technology. It has to be the law simply because the people who make content aren't qualified to dictate what the technology is. What was said here about one game design element is equally true of the printing press. And content owners will always be existing, even if a, even if a entire industry agrees, there'll always be some copyright owner who says, I don't like this technology. This cannot be the law. The technology has to be based on the conduct of the defendant and not the users of that conduct. Anything else would fundamentally be unworkable and would be an absolute bar against innovation. I want to go to Fred, and then I'm going to pose one last question, which I think will be particularly relevant to the audience, and then we're going to throw it open to the audience. If I, if, I, if I thought that America's innovation uh, economy could count on Mr. Verrilli's rep representations, that only the bad guys who make black box cable descramblers would be the ones who saw the wrath of copyright lawyers, I'd be ready to sign off on his views right now. The reality, however, is starkly the opposite. I mean, first of all, when it comes to cable box descramblers, we have a specific law that bans cable box descramblers. Now, if there are, we have done this in copyright before, if there are particular technologies that prove after a time in the marketplace not to be easily uh, uh, incorporated into the copyright regime, we have on occasion enacted laws to regulate specific technologies. The trouble with these general secondary liability principles is they apply to all technologies, not just the black box cable descramblers, not just the you know, computer game mod chips, not just the stuff that I think regular people would agree uh, pose serious problems. Instead, you have a world where you have to remember the major entertainment companies, not every copyright owner, not the small copyright owners, the big entertainment companies who have the money to bring these suits sued Sony for the VCR, sued Sony again for the digital audio tape recorder when that was uh, introduced, sued the first MP3 player manufacturer in the United States, Diamond Rio, sued Replay TV for building a technology that basically made a better TiVo. Uh, it sued Clearplay for making a DVD player that allowed people in their homes to watch, you know, movies without the nasty language, without the dirty scenes, without the stuff that a lot of Americans don't appreciate coming from this very same industry, right? So if I thought it was only the black box cable pirates who were going to face this, the wrath of this legal uncertainty, I'd be a lot less concerned. The thing you have to remember about technology and why it's so important that, frankly, we do err on the side of protecting innovators, the iPod, Apple has sold $9 billion worth of iPods 
since it was introduced. That is an amount of new economic activity that wouldn't have existed, which rivals the entire revenues of the entire uh, music business combined for a whole year. So thanks to innovators, we have now this new business that in fact dwarfs the business of the, in, the industry that frankly is quite upset with some of the new technologies that are available. Now, we can't run the risk of having innovators decide the next person who tries to build the next iPod, the next cutting edge technology. We don't want a situation where they say to themselves, I can never be sure that I've redesigned my product enough to make the music industry happy. Uh, and therefore, maybe I can't get funding for that. Maybe I can't find investors for that. Maybe I can't launch that new product. That's not a world that we should want. Um, I think particularly for many folks in this room, the 800-pound unseen gorilla here is, in light of whatever clarity or lack thereof you all see in this decision, does Congress need to get back into this issue? Um, it made one run at an inducement bill. Um, it, uh, I think, uh, to, put it, to put it mildly, fell apart in the negotiations. Uh, so I guess, uh, Don, why don't we start with you. Does, at this point, Congress need to either strengthen, clarify, uh, whatever on this issue, or are we in a period now where it would be okay to let the lower court sort of process the Supreme Court for a while? Yeah, I think the answer is that the Supreme Court has come up with a common sense standard that uh, despite uh, the fears Fred's expressing, which I think are frankly groundless, the lower courts are going to be able to apply in an effective way uh, to get at the impermissible conduct and, and prohibit it and allow legitimate technology to flourish. And I think that the court got, the, you know, got the basic idea right, which is that there needs to be balance, and that's the central problem with uh, the position that we're hearing uh, expressed here today, uh, that uh, about the court's opinion, that the refuse about not about the court's opinion, about where they'd like the law to be, that uh, there's no balance to it. The idea is that well, you've got to protect technological innovation. Well, you've got to protect creative innovation too. And in fact, there is a constitutional grounding for that in the copyright clause. And what the court's saying is you've got to find balance. We think the court's done a good job in striking an appropriate balance with the with the standard of inducement that it's set forth here, and that it ought to work. And I think. I don't want to be preemptive here, but I do want to make sure I get this out on the table. And the other panels like this that I've participated in with representatives of the technology community, the Consumer Electronics Association and other groups, uh, the view they've expressed as well, and so and I think is a pretty strong sense of the technology community now, is that that's right, that this ought to be, this is a standard that could well work effectively in practice and we ought to let it work in the lower courts and it's not the right time for innovation, uh, intervention by Congress. Fred? Well, I think the key here is that uh, both uh, I and Mr. Verrilli would like to see balance. We, of course, have different ideas of where that balance should be struck. In fact, this was exactly the difference in the briefs that we filed in this case. The unfortunate thing is that the Supreme Court did not actually answer most of the hard questions. And with all due respect to Mr. Verrilli, I don't believe that uncertainty is balance. Uh, and so I think Congress really should look at doing two things. Uh, uh, I think, well, I think it's going to be very difficult for Congress to step in and clarify these hard questions. I wish they could. The inducement fight last year suggests that it's going to be extremely hard. And as you've heard here today, the technology and the content industries are still rather far apart on the questions of contributory and vicarious liability, the issues that the Supreme Court did not answer in the Grokster case. So the two things I think Congress should be doing here, first, we're going to need a sensible solution for the peer-to-peer -peer problem. That's what's driving a lot of what I think are distorted views of copyright. Uh, and I think the only sensible way to get there is talk about a way to fairly compensate artists and copyright owners for what's going on. Uh, it's going to happen anyway. Let's try to raise a reasonable amount of money. Let's try to divide that up. That's what we did with radio 50 years ago. That's what ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, the performing rights organizations have done a fantastic job with. I think Congress should look into ways that we can push that model 
Rather than trying to somehow eliminate peer-to-peer -peer with more lawsuits, instead try to turn it into a paying source of revenues uh, for copyright owners. I think that would take a lot of the pressure off. I think the Register of Copyrights, Mary Beth Peters, has a proposal that she suggested to start reforming the compulsory license in Section 115. I think that's a great first step in that direction. And I think more attention should be paid on that alternative rather than more lawsuits, how many people can we sue, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing is I think we need reform in copyright remedies. Uh, I think if we can't get to certainty about what the rules are, at least we should make it such that companies, if they bet wrong, don't, aren't completely wiped out. Uh, and so I think statutory damages in particular should be taken off the table in secondary liability cases. Copyright owners would still be entitled to injunctions. After all, I think that's primarily what copyright owners are interested in. If, if a product is determined to be unlawful to distribute, they want that distribution stopped. Injunctive relief can get them that. They'll still have actual damages, and frankly, against the companies that Mr. Verrilli is talking about, the black box cable descramblers, all, in fact, even my clients, uh, even small remedies, right, even an actual damages award uh, is probably more than enough to give him the kind of leverage he needs against those folks. But we shouldn't have a, a remedial system where if Microsoft or Apple or Sling bet wrong, they go out of business. Andrew, quickly on Congress involvement. At the end of the day, the question that I ask is whether or not it's possible for a company that has an innovative technology to get investment or even get a lawyer to sign off and say that your risk is manageable or controllable. That means that the Congress should be monitoring and monitoring carefully as Grokster gets uh, more clearly articulated by the lower courts to see if at least that level of certainty has been maintained. Not the absolute certainty that Fred would have or the degree of, uh, of comfort that content owners have that uh, Don is suggesting, but at least the level of uncertainty where you can manage and operate a business, get investment, and bring technologies to market uh, with reasonable risk. I do agree with Fred that the uh, damages and remedies provisions for secondary liability appears unbalanced. Congress should monitor carefully and consider whether or not reform and remedies is appropriate. Uh, that aside, I think it's time to wait and see, uh, but to monitor closely how the case is developed. All right, it's your turn. Um, thank you for listening. In the back. You speak up, please. Um, I'm not sure the uncertainty after Betamax is the uncertainty we live with today. Uh, certainly there is a wide uh, gulf between, uh, apparently, and I think the lawsuits in the last five years have really made this gulf apparent, between what the technology sector thought Betamax meant and what the content industry thinks Betamax meant. And that, frankly, is a fight that really has only surfaced in the last five years. The Napster case really brought this to a head. And after the Napster ruling came down from the Ninth Circuit in 2001, there was a great deal of new uncertainty that that case created. I don't mean to suggest that uh, this uncertainty means we will never see any innovation again. I mean to suggest that you are seeing a chill and products not being brought to market as a result. So sure, we have the MP3 player, thanks frankly to the victory of uh, Diamond Multimedia in that case. But what about Replay TV? Company was driven out of business in part thanks to the lawsuit that was brought against it. And there is no digital video recorder on the market today that offers any of the features that Replay TV offered back in 2001. Right? What about a lot of the new technologies that people are trying to bring to market today to do the kinds of time shifting and space shifting that Jonathan mentioned? These are companies that I hear from their CEOs all the time saying, thanks to something that a CBS executive said in The Hollywood Reporter last week, I'm having a harder time getting investment. Um, so these are issues that I think are serious because after all, if a lawsuit or even a threat of a serious lawsuit had been brought against Bill Gates in the first year or two of Microsoft's existence, 
things might have gone very differently. Thankfully, back then, that wasn't an issue. Today, in the current climate, every technology innovator in the digital media space will tell you that this is a very live issue that they talk about with their investors and with their lawyers all the time. It is not something people talked about in 1984. It's not something they talked about in 1990. It's something that people have talked about since 1999. Our, uh, one of our distinguished guests from Great Britain has a question. Sorry, I don't, I don't that's all right. Um, I really, I think, as a legislator interested in the, the longer-term perspective of what this means, and I think I have a question to each of you. I think, Don, what does it mean for the marketplace in terms of digital services? Is, really, is it significant or not? Um, I think for you, Fred, I wanted to know, you said that you don't think that, um, or it's been the case, that technology companies don't have to design a technology to respect copyright law. So will we now see a change of behavior from technology companies so they think maybe they do have to respect You want to start? Sure. I, you know, I, I'm glad you raised the question about the um, what it means for legitimate services because I think this is something that's critically important. It's critically important about what the Supreme Court did. I know Fred likes to say that peer-to-peer -peer is out there. There's nothing you can do to stop it. But there's a really important reality here, and I think the example that Fred mentioned of radio is actually quite an apt illustration of the reality. And the, the and the key point is this, you've got to get the background rules right. In other words, we want uh, copyrighted material to be distributed in this magnificent, efficient way through the technology of the Internet. We want to do it in a way that's respectful of and protective of the legitimate interests of copyright owners. And so long as you can run a business like Kazaa, Grokster, and Streamcast, and make millions of dollars doing it, you're going to put the legitimate distribution of copyrighted material through legitimate businesses at an extreme disadvantage and at great risk. And you're also going to deter, it seems to me, the, the, the legitimate forms of innovation in distribution because a company that's trying to do this legitimately is always going to be at risk from a company like Grokster who's going to come along and do it illegitimately and take a significant share of its market away from it. And that's why getting the background rules right is critical. It creates the space for the legitimate innovation. And, you know, radio is a good example of that, and it didn't involve an intervention by Congress. The way the, way the story unfolded with respect to radio is that, you know, it's cool new technology. Radio came on the scene. And uh, radio stations would broadcast performances of music without getting the necessary copyright permissions to do so. And the question was whether that was copyright infringement or not. And Congress didn't step in to solve that problem. Two courts of appeals held, held that it was copyright infringement. And in the wake of the courts of appeals in those cases, getting the background rules right, saying, hey, you know, you can't just take it. You can't just take it. That's copyright infringement. Then the marketplace led to the solutions that Fred's describing. The marketplace, copyright owners and the technology companies together came up with a, a solution in the marketplace. But that solution wouldn't have been possible unless you got the background rule right. And the background rule was, hey, you can't take it. You can't just take it. And the same thing is true here. Unless you get the background rules right, you're not going to get the legitimate innovation. And I think the Supreme Court took an important first step in getting the background rules right in the Grokster case. We have case. other questions, so quickly, if you well, guys want to Well, the background rule has always been that you can't take it, right? That wasn't what the MGM versus Grokster case was about. The issue there is whether or not copyright owners get to dictate the shape of the technology marketplace, right? After all, copyright owners had their own home video system in the 70s that they preferred to Sony's Betamax. So, of course, if 
the court had decided against Sony and banned the Betamax, that would have enabled the legitimate alternative, namely Disco Vision, which was the product that the movie studios preferred. That's never been the role of copyright to pick winners in a technology marketplace. So while I'm sure that the Napster 2.0s and all the other uh, music services out there like this opinion, that alone should not be a reason we should warmly embrace it as the right answer for innovators generally. So to answer your question, are we going to see innovators uh, really start changing their products in response to this? I'm afraid that they are. We've already started seeing that. Technology companies, everyone from Replay TV to Sling Media, to all of these products today already include restrictions that are there for only one reason, an effort to try to appease in advance copyright owners who are expected to object as they have objected to every new technology for over a century. So there's already this distortion going on in the marketplace. I worry that continued uncertainty and more lawsuits will only exacerbate the trend. We should have a technology economy where our technology companies have their eyes focused four square on what matters, which is what customers want in the marketplace. If our innovators have to keep one eye over their shoulder to figure out what Hollywood wants, we're going to be lapped by our competitors overseas, right? That's just the reality. If our products can't do as much because our innovators are more timid thanks to our legal climate, then we're really, I think I'm afraid, ceding some of our innovation economy to other countries. Andrew, quickly. There's no doubt that there's an enormous gap of understanding among the public what is the law of copyrights. They read about this case and they think that this is determining whether or not they have the right to engage in file sharing of the kind that they never ever had the right to engage in. A friend of mine recently bought an iPod and started using iTunes Music Store. She thought it was so great she showed it to her daughter who said, oh mom, mom, I can show you the site where you can get it for free. And of course that dialogue is happening all too frequently because of the fact that there is this chasm. A large part of it is because the technology industry and the music industry have both been absolutely incapable of working together to articulate credibly, clearly, and understandably what the rules of the road are. Sure, you can compete with free. You always have been able to compete with free if you provide quality products, quality services in a dynamic way. I think the iTunes Music Store, which just capped half a billion songs in only a few years, has demonstrated that people will pay for high quality content delivered effectively and in a manner that's easy to use and fun. Uh, the fact of the matter is it's up to both the technology industry and the content industry to get their heads out of the hole and stop fighting the war among themselves and concern themselves about the public. I agree the baseline rule needs to be drawn so that that kind of negotiation will happen, but I will tell you that we haven't drawn it yet. And frankly, it's time to show little patience for the kind of loggerheads we're seeing in this kind of litigation and to start encouraging, legislatively or otherwise, the content and technology industry to work it out or just get out of our yard. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think that there are two ways in which it's pro-consumer. One is, uh, and they're related. The first one is this. The, uh, the music and the movies that we all enjoy require a substantial investment. And the big problem with services like Kazaa and Grokster and Streamcast is that they drain staggering amounts of revenue out of le the legitimate systems. And that's revenue that these companies use to find and promote new artists and new projects and new films. The more revenue you drain out of the system, the less revenue there is to take a risk on an unproven commodity or try some new uh, and uh, courageous venture in films. And therefore, the, the, the less quality you're going to get as a consumer. And what I think that this decision has done is take an important first step in recognizing that, you know, this is really a bad problem and that it's got to be fixed. The second important way in which I think this is pro-consumer is the, uh, the, the point I, I made earlier, which is that 
there are legitimate businesses like Apple's iTunes, and, you know, half a billion legitimate downloads is fantastic. Of course, that's uh, over two years, and by best estimates, half a billion downloads is equivalent to somewhere between 10 and 14 days worth of the activity on the unlawful services. So it's great progress, but it's, you know, it's a, they've created a little tiny space in the corner now for this legitimate activity to occur. We want that space expanded, and we think that the Supreme Court's decision is really going to help us do that. And that, I think, will ultimately be pro-consumer because we're going to – that will create the space for legitimate alternative delivery mechanisms to rise up and take advantage of uh, – take advantage of the efficiencies of the Internet in a way that's also respectful of copyright owners. So I think in those two ways, it really is a strongly pro-consumer decision. I, I'd, of course, disagree. The consumer's best friend is always robust competition in an innovation marketplace, right? Napster in 2001 – was better than any of the authorized music services today in 2005, right? Now, that's not to say that we don't need a solution that gets copyright owners fairly compensated. I think we do, and EFF has been talking about ways we can get there, but not at the cost of slowing down that innovation marketplace that really delivers the value to consumers. After all, if there wasn't a peer-to-peer file-sharing universe, as we've seen, there would be no iTunes music store today. Right? Every, uh, everyone in the business I've talked to admits that peer-to-peer -peer is exactly what put the pressure on the record business to move to get into this business. I've, until that time, obviously, we saw nothing but foot dragging. Uh, and even now, the business, you, know, you have music publishers pitted against record labels. It's still very difficult to get those things done. So the consumer's best friend is a marketplace for technology that caters to their needs, not the needs of one you know, entertainment industry. Not unsurprisingly, I think they're both right and they're both wrong. <laughs> in, in, in fact, though that is, we're, 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 we are uh, adjutants for the middle. Uh, but I do believe it's important to do that, and I believe that's the consumer's position. We want to provide consumers with access both to the content, which is so critical, but also the technology to deliver it. People are able to listen to music and enjoy uh, film in ways with their technology never before that the music industry and the film industry fought kicking and screaming every way. It has ever been so since John Philip Sousa complained about the player piano. You cannot trust the content industry to legislate the nature of technology, and you cannot trust technology to willy-nilly go along and, you, and avoid the temptation to exploit as seed capital the content industry's works. The rule has to be in the middle. I believe the active inducement rule the Supreme Court adopted if properly executed and, and, and defined below, uh, can lead us a good way towards that end. Bill Corwin represents some of the P2P industry. In the form of a question, please. That's hard. I want to comment, Senator Gurley. I think if we could limit the comments, and excuse me, if we could limit the comments and, and solicit questions, particularly from congressional staff. But if you have a question, we could move along very quickly. Yeah, we need questions, Bill. Yeah. My question, uh, you know, I'm going to ask a question. Well, just get to it quickly. Okay. Mr. Hurley said that objective factors that could be looked at to see whether there was a chance of this was the failure to use a readily available means to prevent infringement. I disagree with my response. One footnote 12 and 14 makes it quite clear that the failure to use readily available means to only is looked at was not a factor in intent, only a factor looked at was purchase real intent. Okay. Second, what? there's no readily available filtering of technology in the marketplace today, much less when these cases began. Uh, it's something the music industry keeps talking about that never quite gets rolled out and demonstrated. Let's let's ask thank you, Phil. Let's ask now, Don, to sort of clarify. It wasn't me, Phil. <laughs> it's page 22 of the slip opinion. Second, at this, second, this evidence of unlawful objective is given added significance by MGM showing that neither company attempted to develop filtering tools or other mechanisms to diminish the infringing activity using their software. Now, that's in the course of the, the, the court saying three features of the evidence in this case of intent are particularly notable. That was the second of the three. Now, with respect to your claim that filtering doesn't work, 
I, you know, uh, talk to Sean Fanning. He's got something out there. The problem is that the companies that, that your organization represents have said and said in the press, in fact, why would we do that? Why on earth would we impose filtering? We'll lose all our business. And that gets to my point about the background rules. You've got to have the background rules right to encourage people to do this in a legitimate way. Do we have other questions from staff? Phil, I'm sorry, we have to take other questions from staff. Yes, sir. as it might suppress freedom of speech on the internet and in other places. Um, if, if, filter, if ISPs were required to filter or other technologies were required to filter um, or install DRM on the technology, then I'm worried that it will be able to be used to censor um, speech that, for instance, I was involved in a case where a machine manufacturer um, claim copyright on these internal memos, which expose wrongdoing on their part. And if there were filtering on the peer to peer services that we used to distribute those memos, we would not have been able to get those out to the press and to other people like these to know about them um, because the websites were shut down on the same copyright infringement. So I, I was wondering if you could to address that question of tools of speech. Done. Sure. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate the concern, but I think I, I actually don't think it's a concern about filtering that you're talking about. Of course, people can abuse the copyright laws uh, in ways that are suppressive of free speech. Uh, that's not what's going on in this case, obviously, uh, and it's also not what's going on with respect to filtering, which really relies on a digital fingerprint uh, approach, um, and all that will do is. Uh, you either let through or block, depending on how the system works, uh, material that matches a specific digital fingerprint. And that technology is very far along, and it's very narrowly focused to do that one thing. Uh, and it does it quite effectively. And I think in all of the beta tests that I'm aware of, it's done it quite effectively without having any effect on anything else that travels over the system. Do we have? Yeah, but that, I guess what I'm saying is that, that there, that's, not what ha you know, that, that's not what the technology we're talking about does or is even capable of doing. I'm not aware of any technology that's capable of doing it, uh, nor am I aware of any court that would entertain a request to impose a, a remedy of that kind, and it's certainly not anything that my clients are interested in. So, you know, as I, well, I appreciate the fear. I guess my sense of the reality of what we're talking about here is that it, it's, it's not a fear that's going to materialize in the real world. We have time for one last question, if there is one from staff. Yes, sir. I've heard a lot about how technology uh, should be defined or, or developed or directed by copyright holders. And you talk about how Apple has sold $9 million to iPhones, which is more than My question to you is, how many iPods does Apple have sold if every download had to be made? Does that change? Because the, because the reality is a lot of iPods are sold, um, as Mr. Greenberg makes the point, based on the fact that kids and adults and everyone else aren't paying for the music for the download. So in fact, in fact they aren't creating the revenue for Well, we know the answer to that question, ironically enough. Uh, there was a competing MP3 player, there, or a competing digital music player, to be more precise, launched by Sony uh, right around the time of the, uh, of the first Apple iPod. Uh, it's a product that failed so spectacularly, no, none of you, I'm sure, have ever heard of it, and it was yanked off the market precisely because Sony insisted on, as you put it, ensuring that every piece of music that could creep into it was locked up, DRM'd, authenticated, all the rest. And the marketplace just rejected that out of hand. Consumers didn't want a product that treated them like crooks. Right? We sh I don't think we want... Even though they in fact are, 
Even though some of them are, yes, absolutely. I mean, the reality is, the reality is that we shouldn't have a technology environment where every consumer is treated as guilty until proven innocent, right? I mean, I, I myself buy a lot of media, and yet every year that goes by, all of the products I buy and enjoy, from my TiVo to my iPod, all of them treat me more and more suspiciously every year. Even though I'm not violating copyright law, I'm buying the tracks, I'm buying the CDs, the CDs now come with copy protection. All I'm saying is this is not a sensible way to try to align the incentives of a digital economy, which we all live in, and a content industry that we all want to support. Right? We shouldn't want to have these two industries at loggerheads and a system that says, well, we are going to sue until the technologies are built the way we want them built, and technology companies saying, well, we are trying to innovate and give consumers what they want, but we never know when we're on what side of the line. That's, I think, going to be a, a losing proposition for both sides in the long run. Um, After, you, get, you know, every technology that, they, that content industries have objected to at first have ended up making them wealthier in the long run. Every one. Don, you get a very quick last word. The, um, the problem with the uh, Sony, the, the thing that made... Uh, the movie industry money in the long run was not the record feature, of course, of the Betamax. Uh, it was the play feature, which didn't raise any copyright issues. That's what created the market for uh, for home videos, not the record feature. Uh, and, and I guess, the, with respect to the last word, the last word is balance. And I think the, the question we got, uh, the, the last question, points up the need for it. Both of these industries need each other. But you can't have a rule that just says you can take copyright and use it directly or indirectly as the seed capital indeed uh, as your whole business. You need balance. And I think the Supreme Court took a very important first step in that direction in this case. I'm instructed to tell you that um, a webcast and a podcast and maybe other technologies for listening to this <laughs> will be available at netcaucus.org, uh, which is the website, within 24 hours. And if you didn't get a sandwich, you can take one on the way out. Let's give a hand to our terrific and articulate panelists.